And hello. Waiting for it to turn on. There we go. I think I'm official. I think I'm official. I'm not seeing all the things I want to see, but that's okay. What matters is that there I am. I'm seeing the things that I need to see. Um, and uh, so, hello, good evening, welcome. Uh, don't let the bowler hat freak you out too much. A dear friend of mine, Lisa, gave it to me. And uh, because we've been in the, um, what's the, you know, that thing where we all stay inside until we go crazy and kill our families. Lockdown. We're in lockdown. So um, I am. Uh, I figured this was a good opportunity to wear my bowler. So here I am. It does not have a steel brim like odd jobs. I can't kill anybody with it, so you're all safe. But anyway, hello, good evening, and uh, lovely to see you guys. It is 2 o'clock in the morning, California time, and presumably that means it's some kind of interesting time in other parts of the world. So glad to have you with me. Right, let me sit up closer. I'll show you my shirt. Ta-da! The U. All right, that's what I'm wearing. And um, wanted to mention, if any of you have any questions you want to ask me, I can't guarantee that I will get a chance to answer them, but uh, put them when you write your comment or whatever, put question in big capital letters so I can see what's going on. Look, it's folding my head. I'm gonna have strange folds in my head from wearing a bowler. Our, our, one of our dogs has strange folds in his ear, actually. Um, our big dog, Johnny, because he was actually, um, he has a little bit of Scotty in him, even though he's quite a large dog, he has a little bit of Scotty in him. And I couldn't figure out, there didn't seem to be any physical signs of his Scottiness. And then I finally noticed that he has Scotty ears that stick up, except they don't. They kind of tilt over like that. But you can tell they're not meant to, because when you look at the inside of his ear, there's actually a little crease that isn't natural. It's one that's developed since his puppyhood. So he actually has ears kind of like Sister Bertrill from The Flying Nun, if you ever remember that ancient show with Sally Field in it. Um, but uh, so that's, I don't know where that came from. I was just babbling on. Oh, dog ears. I don't know why I was on dog ears. Anyway, lovely to see you. Good to be here. And I hope you all are taking good care of yourselves, that you are sheltering in place where it is appropriate and uh, that you are still occasionally sneaking out when it's appropriate to get a little bit of uh, outside air and see the world which is still out there and uh, in fact seems to be doing okay without us. What a shocker. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight besides as I said if anybody has a question. Um, oh and there is a question already from Ilva. Question, what story did you finish the other day? Um, oh God, now you're asking. I think I was reading, um, it was another long one. It wasn't The Stranger's Hands, because I read that for the late night audience, the same one I'm speaking to largely now. Um, gosh, I can't remember. I've been doing so many of these things now, by my standards anyway. Um, it'll come to me. It was uh, another longish story. Oh, I think it was um, uh, the, the, the one from the Magic Anthology. That's what I read last. Um, I read the story, uh, the stuff that dreams are made of. Anyway, what I'm going to read tonight is I'm going to read a story. Uh, Ilva, who I just, who sent me a question here in the sidebar. Um, Ilva actually requested this story, so I'm going to read it. It is uh, a little far afield from the kind of largely funny uh, happy, cheerful ones I've been reading. Um, it's, it's a little darker in mood. Uh, it's called Z is Four, and I will read it to you in just a moment. Before I do that, just wanted to give you a quick update on what's going on around our place, um, which is more of the same, but no, nothing bad. Uh, we're all staying well. We are all trying to uh, do things at home that, that, uh, that we should be doing or that we can be doing. We're trying to do a few more things together as a family, but then at a certain point, family closeness becomes more of a, <laughs> a duty than, 
then a cheerfulness uh, on the part of some of our residents and they go and lock themselves in their room for long hours at a stretch, but that's okay. We all need a little privacy and uh, a little freedom when we live in a household under lockdown with uh, several other people. So I'm not complaining and uh, we're, we're doing well. Nobody's gotten sick. We're, you know, we still have food in the refrigerator and uh, all that good stuff. So we're doing well. We're trying to stay in touch with our friends. We Skyped uh, with some dear friends uh, last night before last. We Skyped with another dear friend on Sunday. So we're basically just kind of doing our best to stay in touch with everybody. It's a tough time. And the toughest part, of course, is the not knowing exactly what's going to happen. Excuse me, one of my creatures is just walking along there in the background. I don't know if you uh, no, she's gone past all. Um, I'm just trying to, these things always confuse me. Now, she's out of the picture. She's crept along somewhere. Anyway, our, our rather large-ish, a rather plump cat and uh, named Lily. So what I am going to do is I am going to read, and eventually this crimp mark from wearing my hat is going to come out. Uh, again, this is a story, <clears throat> well, I think there's actually a little introduction to it. So yes, so I can, I will read it. Um, this is the only place this one is connected. This is my very first collection of fiction, short fiction called Write, R-I-T-E, <clears throat> which was published by Subterranean Press back some years ago. I don't remember exactly, what, 2006, which seems like a long time for some of you. For me, it doesn't seem very far back at all. Anyway, so... I'm going to read this short story, and then I'm going to read a very little short uh, other thing, shorter other thing. But first, before I do, I'm going to read this story, which, as I mentioned, was uh, a request. It's a request. So it's going out to all the folks in Kassel, Deutschland. So um, anyway, it says here, this is probably the oldest story in the collection, meaning this collection. This is probably the oldest story in the collection, at least the oldest that's still in its original form. It appeared in, and might even have been written for, a small magazine called Midnight Zoo. That means written expressly for, I think, that was Chuck Von Rossbach's magazine, and I think he contacted me and asked me if I wanted to contribute a story. Um, it's one of the few things I've ever written based on a dream. People often say, you must have incredible dreams, presumably because I make my living with my imagination. But to be honest, I don't remember most of them after I wake up. That's still true. Every now and then, though, something sticks with me. And many of them are endless house dreams of some kind. This one, minus the African fauna, was one of those. And I woke up from it feeling very disturbed indeed. So the house dreams, of course, those of you who've read the other land books will be aware of my fixation with large endless houses and uh, how one such thing became a part of the Otherland story. Although it's uh, the idea for the, the world that was a gigantic house, an endless house, um, was something that had been in my mind for some time before I wrote Otherland. But Otherland was a bit of a kitchen sink project where I got to throw in lots of other things um, that entertained and interested me and partially written short stories and in fact, there's a joke in the Otherland books, for those of you who didn't realize it already, which is I used to call Otherland my kitchen sink books because, um, you know, there's an old English expression about uh, everything but the kitchen sink, meaning everything. Um, and so I actually made a world in the Otherland world because Otherland was that kind of a book where I was using old ideas, things I'd never finished, stuff that had intrigued me for all my life all these different things from everywhere. So because I started referring to it as the kitchen sink novel or a kitchen sink novel for that reason, um, I eventually created a cartoon world as one of the virtual worlds in Otherland, which um, literally you had to enter through a kitchen sink. So anyway, so now I'm going to read to you this story written, God, probably back in the late 80s, I'm guessing. And it's called Z is Four. And then I will do some other stuff. I don't need glasses for this. It works better without them. Z is four. 
zebras? It is an odd thought. Something else, too. Uh, a rainy day? What the hell? Harold's chin hits his chest. He bounces back into wakefulness. A reddish light is in his eyes. A dull, grumbling sound like a sleeping tiger fills the room. He is where? He struggles briefly, drags his arms free from some clinging thing, a sheet, a blanket, something, and sits up, head heavy, yet somehow not well connected. Harold looks around, a room, a bedroom, spray of straw flowers and a vase on a dresser, skeletal in the strange light. A red shawl is draped over the lamp, crimsoning the walls, the shadowy frame photographs of someone's pale, moon-faced friends, lovers, family. The grumbling breaks up into gasps and grunts. Harold is on the floor, slumped against the bed. The noises are coming from someone on the bed, some two. A party. He is at a party. He has been there a long time. He shakes off the last twining tentacle of the bed cover and crawls across the deep pile carpet, heading for the crack of brighter light he thinks, hopes, is the door. The odd thought of zebras is still floating in his brain, white and black, shimmering like heat lightning. Shake their heads, then gone. The noises from the bed continue. He passes a foot dangling from beneath the sheet, corpse-like, but for the jiggle, time to the rising chorus of gunnels. Who's up there? How did Harold wind up in the room with them? Fell asleep, he thinks. Fell asleep in the dark on the floor, everyone too drunk and fucked up to notice. Or maybe they liked the idea, an audience. They are beyond noticing now, anyway. He pushes the door open with his head, like his old black cat with its pet door, he thinks. Cat's name? Can't remember. Seems like a long time ago. Good cat, though. Scabby, but lots of chutzpah. No fur left on his butt, hardly, but the very soul of confidence. Why can't he remember the damn cat's name? The hall is empty and surprisingly long. Loud music and the din of many voices drift up from what looks like a stairwell at the far left end. Harold turns and crawls in that direction. Head feels like a wad of glue, like the white glue from elementary school crafts, drying to a sticky skin on top, but still wet underneath. Head feels like that. Too much to drink, too, too much of something, anyway. He remembers a guy in a bow tie screaming about Metaxa, some damn Greek liquor. Everybody had to slug some down, matter along or some ridiculous shit like that. Drink Greek stuff, wake up glue headed. Harold likes the sound of this and repeats it a few times in semi somber rhythms as he crawls toward the stairs. Drink glue stuff, wake up, drink Greek stuff, wake up glue headed. Drink Greek stuff, wake up blue-headed. His head is hanging over the abyss of carpeted stairs before he realizes how far he has crawled. He sways briefly as words rise from below like ash flakes heat fluttering over a campfire. I swear he did. I swear it. You would say that. You told me the last time you went out of town, too. Wasn't that what you said the last time you went? Wasn't it? Two dark shapes come slowly up into the hall light. One dark, one light, like some kind of religious painting. Man, black hair, blue clothes, glasses, blonde woman in white dress, 30-ish, talking like a teenage girl. Harold hates that. He rolls to the side so they can step up into the hallway. Take my advice. Leave that Greek shit alone, he mutters. They pass him silently as if he had asked for money on a street corner. Harold doesn't know them. Whose fucking party is this? Why did he come? What is this zebra thing nudging his memory? Did he puke on somebody's striped upholstery? Fake for a coat? He curls up on the topmost step, feet against the baluster, knees before his chin. He has no shoes, but his socks, though 
inexplicably damp are clean and without holes. Some relief there. As he sits, a dim me memory surfaces, a brief movie of himself wandering out of the noise, up some stairs, into quiet. He looks back down the hallway. Does look a little familiar. Sure is quieter here than it sounds like it, down, like it is downstairs. He squints. The man and woman have gone, vanished somewhere down the dark hall. K.O.'s party? Somebody's party anyway. Zebras. Somebody whose name starts with a Z, maybe. Z's party. Zazu's party. Zorba's party. Sounds like it's been going a long time, anyway. Harold struggles to his feet. His head feels far too heavy, making his entire rickety body unstable. Still, all things considered, the old headeroo is holding together remarkably well then it's full of glue, so no surprise there. He has to remain standing now. There are several more people crouching or sitting at the bottom of the stairwell, and he'll never get past them to find his date. His date? He'll never get past them crawling, especially crawling downstairs. He has a faint recollection that he tried crawling down some stairs in the recent past, but remembers only that it was definitely a mistake. Well, you probably missed the part where they announced it, someone is saying as Harold goes, banister clutching, stiff-legged among the clot of bodies. A young man's voice, calmly rational. I mean, it's not the same thing, but they have ads now that look just like shows. But it wasn't, says what in the semi-dark and sort of, and it says what in the semi-dark sounds and sort of looks like a young woman. Her voice says that she is a little upset, but willing to be talked out of it. I mean, I would have known. It really was the news. You know, that guy from Channel 6. The one with a wig, someone asks. The worst wig. There is an explosive laugh. Harold pushes past, putting his new bipedality to an immediate test, forced to half jump over a salad bowl full of pretzel sticks and other crunchy treats left on the floor. He makes it, grabbing a chair back for support on landing, looks around. A smallish room, dining room maybe, big table in the center, bowls of dip and other things, lights down. Music is not from this room. He hears it loudest from the far door as he swivels his head like a radar dish. The room is familiar though, that's something. He's seen that painting before, maybe earlier tonight. Some expressionist Mexican temple, Aztec, some damn thing. Seen the painting, likes it actually, nice colors. Reddish gold, black, white. The chair back under his hand is remarkably solid. Chair is occupied. Older man, wire rim glasses, sweater, talking to a young couple. Harold has been leaning too close, he realizes. Inappropriate. Must look like a drunk. Thinks he recognizes the man in the sweater, but doesn't want to admit he isn't sure. Did they work together once? Howdy, Harold waves cheerily. Sorry, just resting. Before they are forced to reply, he pushes himself off like a boat leaving shore and tacks toward the center of the room. Doing pretty well, actually. One foot casually in front of the other. One, two, one, two. Points himself toward door to music. Rest of party. Helen's party? Isn't it Helen's from the department? But where did she get such a big house? Zebras, too. Something about zebras. It, it was important. Suddenly veers to the side when he spots telltale pale gleam of porcelain counters through another narrowly open door. Bathroom. Ah, yes, right idea. Harold stops and knocks politely. Social skills are returning. No answer, so he pushes the door open. A woman's purse is on the counter, lipsticks lying scattered like spent rifle cartridges, but no woman is attached. Just be a moment, Harold thinks, remembers to lock the door so purse owner doesn't bang it open, scream, accuse Harold of exhibitionism or sniffing her makeup or something. There was some embarrassing incident earlier, he suddenly remembers, or at another party, maybe? Seems like a long time ago. Anyway, some woman slapped him. 
not too hard, but not really friendly like either. Pissed him off. He was just trying to tell her something, something about Z. That was it, something about zebras. But she slapped him, sour-faced bitch. Memories stop for a moment while he deals with his own face. Oh God, not good. Pale, whiskery, eyes bleary as poached eggs, but still, thank you Jesus, recognizably his own. Not like most of the other faces floating around here. Yes, Harold's face. Harold's shirt too. Top button open, tie gone, but thank you again, Jesus. No weird stains on clothing. No puke, no snot, no spit. Alarming to wake up on the floor, but reassuring to know you just look drunk and stupid, not disgusting. Harold turns to the toilet and unzips. Ames thinks for a moment, then decides not to push his luck. Turns and sits down. Splashing is louder than the music in here. Kind of rustic and pleasant. Lights are harsh as a motherfucker, though. He claws for the switch and kills it, leaving only a glowing Nautilus shell nightlight. Pinkish. Much better. Finished, he retains his seat for a moment, thinking. Runs a little cold water, scooped awkwardly out of the sink at his side, splashes it on his face, then feels for a towel and dabs. The towel is fluffy, but it smells of someone else's body. Time to go home. No question about it. Shouldn't drive. Well, maybe drive real slow. Windows open. Get some air. Drive slow. Back streets. And again, maybe not so slow. Need to sober up after all. Yeah, why not? Drive Drive like some beast through the plains, running, wind rushing, running like a gazelle, a zebra, zebras again. Like the imagined wind, the chill travels over him at the thought, and a little more of his drunkenness evaporates. Something's there, a stone in his mental shoe. Something wrong. Let's go. His pants are down around his ankles. He fumbles in his pockets, but there are no keys. Must be in his jacket. Find that, find the keys. Brilliant deduction, Sherlock. Elementary, my dear fucking Harold. Let's go find the keys. It's remarkably difficult to open the door with a light out, but still easier than trying to find the light switch again. Finally, the door pops free, swings inward. Harold stalks out heads toward the room with the music. Here's the party. Here it is. Big room, full of people, lights down, but for a flickering television. Picture windows showing black sky, salted with stars, and a, a different kind of darkness that he somehow remembers is the ocean. Big room, big house. It feels suddenly like he's been there for years. Halfway across the room, he forgets where he is going. As he wavers, he realizes that he is standing between two people talking. They continue as though he is no more than a cloud crossing a sunny sky above their heads. So just tell me where you live, the thin, intense-looking man says. Simple enough question. Woman laughs. Here, of course, I think. I mean, here, here at the house. Harold pushes himself on a few steps and slumps onto an empty end of the long couch, feeling the leather squish beneath him. He peers sideways at the couple. They are talking more softly, both laughing now, but he feels sad looking at them. He doesn't know why. They're the zebras, he thinks suddenly. They're dying and they don't even know it. Dying species, this couple. But why? What a stupid fucking thought. Why zebras? Folks got no stripes. He looks slyly around the room, trying to trick his loopy brain into seeing full, a room full of people with exotic striping, flashing velt racing colors. But no luck. They are boring, boring people. Urban, suburban Caucasians, mostly. Oh, a couple of Asians in the corner, slow dancing, the girl slender and small. 
back of a black guy's head in the lighted kitchen, but no stripes anywhere, no zebras. But he saw zebras when he was a child. It comes back like a switch flipped on. Child Harold, long ago, wet day, rainy, gray. We said we were going to the zoo, so we're damn well going day. The zebras stood huddled in one corner of their enclosure, a carpet of grass and dripping trees atop a great cement island, rising out of a rain-rippled moat. Little Harold threw a peanut, but it splashed well short of concrete zebra land. Brown, mournful African eyes turned to look at him. We're dying, the eyes said. So am I, Harold says quietly now, and the great sadness rises up climbing over him like creeping night, choking him like the dust of the Serengeti plain, dying. He turns his attention to the television. Pictures flicker on the box, seemingly unconnected, snatches of old movies, bits of news broadcasts, fragments of commercials from all eras. Someone must be playing with a channel changer. But no, the glowing station indicator remains steady as the Nautilus nightlight. Some goddamn postmodern bullshit. Video wallpaper. He stares, fascinated. There seems no rhyme or reason, even beyond postmodern. Somebody has dumped bits of tape together, spliced them at random, empty pictures, ghosts with no dignity, mindless specters dancing on the photon tracks. Punk rock nihilist crap. Sadness becomes an itch. Gotta find the keys. Gotta get out of here. Need air. Gotta drive, run, bust out. He pushes up off the couch, control coming back. Something else coming back, memories, a memory. Zebras, he had said, and the woman had slapped him. We're zebras. No, something else, but almost that. He still didn't remember what exactly, but still, surely no reason to slap a guy. But he'd meant it. It had been important. Fuck the keys. Just a little air first. Passes three more people, all vaguely familiar. That last one, the guy with the big ears, named something like Freiburg? Right, Freiburg. Worked at the university. Linguist. Harold stops. That's a big chunk all coming back at once. More than that, there's, there's something important there. Is it Freiburg's party? Harold turns to ask. Fuck the embarrassment. So he's drunk. He'll apologize tomorrow. But Freiburg has disappeared. No, Harold suddenly remembers. It was another party that Freiburg had hosted. Champagne, little sweet things baked by Dorothy, what's her name, celebrating what? Something that Harold was in on too. At the university, of course. They had been selected for what? Government grant, an honor, something big. Freiburg had said the greatest opportunity that can be imagined or something like that. Meant it too. Harold remembers that he had thought so himself. A great opportunity. But now there is a core of pain to the thought. A cold ache, like too much ice cream against the teeth. As these memories tease him, Harold sees a sliding door to the patio. Someone is out there in the pool of light from the fake wrought iron lamp. Her hair is full and curly, light brown with a faint greenish tinge from the lamp glow. Dorothy. Of course, he feels a tug. Was it Dorothy he came with? Dorothy who worked at the university with him? A office across the hall? As he stares at the back of her head and her slender shoulders, he suddenly knows there is a connection of some kind between them, a thread of relationship slender but sticky as spider silk. He thinks he has it for a moment, but then it's gone, leaving nothing in its place but the dull static of the party. What's wrong with my fucking head? Harold feels another cold shiver. What did he drink tonight? Just that Greek stuff? Could that be enough to turn him into a goddamn mental patient? Could the liquor be bad somehow? Gone rotten during some slow journey out of the Mediterranean on a boat full of singing guys with beards? 
His laugh at this thought is a gurgle. He lurches outside to the patio and puts a hand onto Dorothy's shoulder. Hey! When she turns and sees him, her eyes flash terror. The grazing animal that sees the predator too late. She flinches back as if he might strike her. Get away, she says, taking a step toward the house. Don't talk to me. He stares for a moment, shocked. What has he done? He has an abrupt vision of her hand arcing around to strike him, and now it is he who flinches. But she has not moved. He has remembered only. You hit me, he says slowly. She did. He remembers now, remembers Dorothy wide, wide brown eyes and the sudden sting. Why did you hit me? She is poised to flee. In the lantern light, she is all sharp angles of light and shadow, except for the soft cloud of her hair. You're frightening me, Harold. Go away. He extends a shaking hand as if to hold her, but knows it will only make her bolt. Suddenly he knows there are critical things here, things he should remember. Tell me, he says gently, but even speaking quietly, he hears his voice tremble. Why did you hit me? She stares as if trying to decide. A man leans out of the door, a tall fellow with a beard, Mickelson. Harold doesn't like him, although he doesn't know why. Dorothy, come on, come inside. She continues to stare at Harold. Mickelson makes an impatient gesture. Please come in, Dorothy, you, you shouldn't be out there. He looks around, vaguely uncomfortable. It's not good, come in. When she does not reply, Harold feels certain that Mickelson will come out and get her. Mickelson is pushy, Harold remembers, a know-it-all. Someone who will always tell you why your idea is wrong, your theory untenable. Usually he's right, but that doesn't make him any more tolerable. But he was wrong one time, Harold remembers suddenly, one critical time, very wrong. The memory is there somewhere. But Mickelson, pushy Mickelson, does not come out. He stares worriedly around the empty patio like a peasant in a nighttime graveyard, swears, then slides back into the murmuring dark of the party. Dorothy runs a hand through her hair. I'm sorry, but you frighten me. But why? He lifts his hand again, leaves it hanging in air. Tell me. I, I can't remember anything. I'm sorry, Dorothy, I'm drunk as shit. He stares at her. Did I bring you here to the party? Her gaze loses focus. No, I don't remember who I came with, but not you, Harold. She laughs harshly. Not with you and your zebras. What about them? A glimmering of crazy hope. Something will be explained. You rant about them all the time. You scare me. What did I say to you? Why did you hit me? She looks around now, as Mickelson did, as though the suburban plank fence might become a horror movie sliding wall, edging in to crush her. You scare me, she says. Leave me alone. Her face is indeed frightened, but there is something else there, struggling too, struggling to get free. I'm going to talk to Pete. Mickelson's first name, Harold remembers. Before he can close the distance between them, she slips away, a swirl of shadowed skirt over a lean haunch, a pale shape vanishing through the doorway. A puff of noise from inside is freed as she billows open the drapes on the sliding door, a clack as the screen slides closed. Harold, beneath the moon, feels sobriety growing like a brittle skeleton beneath his skin and meat. Stark fear in Dorothy's face. Fear in Mickelson's face, too. And even Freiburg, when he went past, had the, the nervous, doomed look of a Dachau trustee. Another voice from the doorway. Harold steps back into the shadows, looks up to see the moon overhead, flat and unreal as a bone poker chip. There is a little scuffle as the screen door slides open. A voice raised in sorrow. The girl he had seen earlier with two men. She's crying. But I saw it, she wails. You saw it too. They're coming. It was on the news. Come on, Hannah, 
one of the men says, like War of the Worlds, you know, just a joke. It was on the news. She is struggling to catch her breath. I, I want to go home, she whimpers, then subsides into hiccuping sobs. Come on, you can lie down for a while. There's a bed upstairs. You're just tired, Hannah, the other adds. Come on, we'll sit with you. A little huddle of humanity staggers back inside, leaving Harold alone again. The A group. It suddenly comes back to him. We were the A group. The impressive gleam of the title is no more convincing than the medal plate on a bowling trophy. He doesn't remember much, but he remembers that something went wrong. Freiburg, me, Dorothy, Pete, others. We were the best. They picked us because we were the best. Suddenly the yard seems to be closing in on him, just as it did on Dorothy. The gnarled fruit trees seem to reach out with taloned fingers. The murmuring doorway is another trap, innocent and seductive as a quicksand pit. He wants desperately to get away. Now, go home, fuck the keys, fuck the jacket, walk. That's good, breathe there. Think. He reaches the garden wall in a few steps, pulls himself up, remembers he has no shoes as he catches a splinter in the ball of his foot. The fence, flimsy, made for suburban show and not to resist invasion, like more ancient walls, wavers as he reaches the top. A scramble, a pop shirt button, and he tumbles into the dewy grass on the far side. Before him, lit only by the two-dimensional moon, stretches the flat, dark plain of someone else's lawn, and beyond it, the black blanket of the ocean. Harold scrambles to his feet and begins to walk. When it happened... There. What is it? Just out of reach. When it happened, they went to find linguists. The government wanted the best and they, they took us, the A group, the A team we called ourselves for a joke, like the TV show. A historic moment, Freiburg said, something the people in our field have dreamed about for years, contact with another species. Harold sucks in a breath and stops. It, the landing. And we wanted to speak with them to share our thoughts and dreams and learn the secrets they would bring us, the songs of the stars. Abruptly, Harold begins to run, the lawn flying away beneath him, his socks soaking through to his cold feet. His own breath is ragged in his ears. But how are we to know they didn't come just as explorers, but as conquerors? The A group, Harold remembers now, remembers the whole sad joke. I laughed at the end when those solemn spidery creatures put us in that white room and, and told us what they were doing outside. The Z group, they should have called us, I said. Not the first, the last. I laughed. God, how I laughed. Hurting, hurting. And Dorothy slapped me. Z is for zebras in the zoo. He slips on some small dark thing on the lawn and stumbles so that for a few staggering steps he windmills his arms for balance. He doesn't look down. He knows what it is. The zebras, he remembers. That long ago rainy day, did they see the people watching them? Me, and my folks, the riffraff zoo crowd, fat women and screaming children spilling popcorn, or, or did they somehow still see the veldt stretching all around them? Just out, of, just out of reach, beyond the bounds of their captivity. Some of them knew, Harold realizes, their eyes had said so. You killed us, those brown eyes said. Now the few of us you've saved for your own pleasure are dying too. Captivity is another sort of death. As he sees his other shoe lying on the wet grass beneath him, he strikes the invisible thing the barrier. A terrific force lifts him and shakes him, filling him with lightning from scalp to toes. 
on the ground as consciousness flutters away like a firefly down a long dark tunnel, he knows he will awake again, back in the cage with the rest of his milling herd. They know there is something wrong. Deep down, all of them know, but it has been artificially suppressed somehow, or perhaps they themselves have beaten it down. Is that the best way? Harold is sliding into darkness. Just stop fighting? Like the zebras, he thinks, maybe the only possible victory is to stand and, and suffer and shame the conqueror. Maybe someday he will learn not to run against the fences. And that is the end of the story, children. I hope you can all go to sleep now. No, seriously, I, that was one that came from a dream. I had a dream and it was only when I woke up that I realized that the party dream that I'd been having was actually uh, like an alien ant farm for people. Um, so that's where that story came from way back before I had even become a full-time writer, I think. And uh, yes, and I believe Chuck Von Rossbach was who I wrote it for, whom I wrote it for. So, oh, let me put my glasses back on, one of my many pairs of glasses here, and see if anybody has added any questions before I read this other little bit. Oh, somebody's up at 2 a.m. in Washington State. Hi, Brandon. You're crazy. Tell us about the new book, please, says Ron. Okay, um, I will do that. I will do that before I read. Okay, various people saying hello to each other. Hi, Cliff. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jessica, Ulf, Cindy, Ron, Sandra, Bernard. Okay, excellent. Oh, Bernard, Bernard's in Norway. Excellent. And Patrick, hello. Patrick says hello from Recklinghausen. Okay, um, I am very glad to see all of those things. And I would like to, um, please, Ron asked. Ron asked, um, oh, okay, here's another one. All right. Ilva says, you misunderstood my question. Question, what story did you finish writing the other day? Okay, all right. So, Ilva, the story that I finished writing was, in fact, the new short novel. Um, those of you who are, are uh, Demon Tad's work aficionados will know that when I started the Last King of Ostinard series, the trilogy that follows on 30 years later from the Dragonbone Chair, etc., that I also said I was going to do two short novels as well. One of them already came out. It was called The Heart of What Was Lost, and it was the kind of a bridge novel between uh, the, what happened at the, at the end of um, To Green Angel Tower and the first of the new books. Not specifically stuck just between them in time, but a uh, conceptual bridge. And there was another one still to come, another short novel, which I was originally going to publish after I finished The Navigator's Children, the last book of the new trilogy. But I realized the other day when the Navigator's Children got pushed back to October of 2021 because of, among other things, coronavirus, um, that I was going to have some extra time. And in fact, it made sense to work on the short novel because the short novel actually would be better if it comes out before the long novel, because the short novel is about, among other people, Hakatri. And those who are reading the new books know that Hakatri, the brother of Inaluki, who eventually becomes the Storm King, is significant in those books. So we get to see Hakatri in the world he lived in, along with Inaluki and various others. And so that's called, at this moment, The Shadow of Things to Come. Um, I may change the title. Deborah likes it. It's not my favorite. It was more of a placeholder. Um, so I don't know for certain what's going to happen, but that's what's going on. So, sorry I misunderstood the question, Orville. I'm sure it was my fault somehow, because as my wife and children explained to me, it always is. All right, now I'm going, well, let me see, was there anything else I was going to talk about? Nah, not really, not really. So I'm gonna just read another short thing and then have another few remarks. So, um, this is also from Wright. What this is, is this is the introduction, but you have to remember that it's called Wright. R-I-T-E, 
Okay. So, um, so this is, a, as I said, it's an introduction. It's called Why I Write with the W, Why I Write What I Write. And the subheading is why I write things like why I write what I write and why I wrote the other things in write. Right? Okay. First of all, I must admit to being an absolute sucker for words and for people who use them in an interesting way. Groucho Marx, Shakespeare, Bob Dylan, Gracie Allen, James Joyce, Manuel the Spanish waiter on Faulty Towers. I love active, playful use of language. Many of my early literary crushes were on writers who really enjoyed creative wordplay. You couldn't read Ray Bradbury or Anthony Burgess or Theodore Sturgeon without recognizing that someone was having fun as well as telling a story. So it seemed fairly obvious that someone like me, if he ever became a writer, was going to have a soft spot for words. More than that, I appreciated diversity not just of language, but of interests. Most of my favorite writers were all over the shop, writing whatever caught their attention at any given moment, naturalistic, fantastic, fiction, nonfiction. When I fell for Harlan Ellison as a young reader, it wasn't just his stories that excited me, it was his nonfiction too, his rants against things he loathed, as well as his support of what he thought was righteous. But it was the richness of his expression that really grabbed me. Similarly, when I discovered and fell in love with Hunter S. Thompson, it was the way he reached for whatever tools would do the job. If you couldn't describe what a horror of a president Richard Nixon was by using ordinary journalistic means, then you had to resort to talking about monstrous shapes, all hair and bleeding string warts loping across the White House lawns at night. What does all that add up to? Language. I love this stuff, like a fat man loves butter. Diversity, wanting to do and use anything that might help make the impression you want on an audience. I'm in favor of that too, you betcha. Oh, and a wide, if slightly shallow, appreciation of lots of different subjects of interest. You name it, I'm probably interested in it, or willing to be for as long, as long at least enough to work it into a story. So you roll all that together, and that's the kind of writer I've always wanted to be, and have largely been. Another factor that has affected the contents of this anthology is that I've largely been a writer of very, very long novels. This isn't by choice necessarily, but since it's how I, I sustain my career, it means that short fiction has always had to take second place. It has to happen when I'm not in the middle of something crucial on a novel. Also, because I feel guilty about stealing time from the books I've already been paid to write, I seldom write short stories without some precipitating cause, which is generally of the anthological persuasion. In other words, some editor gets hold of me, says, we're doing this great anthology, so-and-so is writing a story for it, and so-and-so, and the concept is really cool, and we'd love to get a story from you. And if something clicks, usually the glimmer, uh, first glimmer of an idea, then I'll say yes. Thus, more than half the stories here were generated because of anthologies or other solicitations. Hey, big boy, you interested in deploying a little short fiction? I'd like to write more of these, but novels take a lot of time. So in the near future, I'm probably going to keep averaging only one or two of these per year. The pull never goes away though. One of the things that I love about short fiction is it enables me to use a greater part of my range, such as a wider span of subject matter and a greater emphasis on humor, just to name two. I love being funny, or at least trying to be, and it's always been a huge part of my creative persona, but it's hard to write a million word, multi-volume story that primarily goes for laughs, so my sense of humor plays a more confined role in my novel writing. Anyway, I hope that those of you who only know my long works will appreciate getting to see what I think is a fuller example than usual of what I actually do. And it's signed by me in Woodside, California, March 20th of 2006, says, P.S., as far as this first piece, why I write what I write, I'll be brutally honest. I don't remember why I wrote it or where it appeared, but it's a pretty good short summation, albeit silly in places, of my raison d'écrire. All I remember for certain about its origin is that I thought about making it purposely overdramatic, like one of those heroic wartime short films, Why We Fight. But then I stepped in some honesty and changed plans. See, I can remember that, 
I just can't remember where it appeared. I hope that means I'm not technically senile. The disturbing thing is someone will read this and say, hey, he wrote that for the program booklet they passed out at something con, or he did that for our website, following that recognition with the thought, and he doesn't even remember, but he's putting it in this book anyway. <laughs> what an idiot. It's sad when other people have to help you remember your own life, unless they're researchers and you've hired them with the big fat bonus you got for your autobiography. Sadly though, here, I'm just an idiot. Um, I only read that to you just because it is the kind of uh, question that when you write stories for a living, when you tell lies for a living that people often ask, um, you know, which is how do you, how do you get into this stuff? What, what lures you out of the, uh, the road of decency and, and down the, the dark alleys of silliness and weirdness and unlikely happenstance? Um, the other thing, and this is just, you know, off the cuff, but I'm thinking about it now. The other thing, of course, is that I have a terrible, terrible case of what if ism. What if is a meaning like if you virtually anything that you show me or tell me about the world, my first question is, well, what if this happens? What if that? Um, it totally drove my, my son crazy because my son is a video game aficionado, a freak, a lover of video games. And I, I missed video games. I just, for, I mean, I played them in pizza parlors and stuff, but I, I never was into the early days of gaming. I was already married. I was writing. I was doing other things. And I just never particularly got into games. Got nothing against them. I think they're a great art form. Um, I think they're marvelous things that can and will continue to be done and greater things still ahead that we can't even imagine yet in the field of gaming. But I don't personally do a lot of gaming. Um, so when my son would show me, you know, the first games that he was playing, like, you know, whatever they were, Mario Kart or something, and I'd go, well, what happens if you turn off the road here? And he'd say, you can't. I'd go, well, what happens if you, like, jump the track and you just keep heading for the edge? He'd go, y it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and I would be very frustrated. I would say, you know, well, what's the point? What's the point if you can't go where you want to, if you can't mess up the process, if you can't throw in a, a curveball every now and then and just do something completely different? But I realize that's one of the reasons that, you know, I'm, I, 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 like, I like what I do and why I'm comfortable doing it is because, you know, it's, it's cheap, first of all. It doesn't cost a whole lot to be a writer. Um, and the, all the most expensive bits only happen in imagination, either yours or the readers or both. So it's a great way to, 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 you know, I make my own sandbox games and I can make the sandbox as big as I want it to be. And I do love that. And I'm always asking myself, why did this happen? What if it didn't happen? What if this character suddenly said, no, I won't do that? Or what if this other character suddenly had a heart attack? and just drop down dead. It happens, you know, it happened to me while I'm doing this. I hope not, I'm knocking wood. But uh, so I, that's kind of the kinds of things that I ask myself is, you know, what if this changed? What if that changed? You know, oh, look, there's all those people standing in a line. What if gravity was suddenly reversed and they all started to float away? Would they hang on to each other so they could stay in a line? You know, it depends on what they were in line for. You know, I just stuff, I, you know, I, I see something and I say, well, what if something different happened? Or what if this went the exact opposite? What if food ate us? <laughs> you know, I, it doesn't matter. I just, that's the way I am. And for some people, that's a crippling disability because you wind up standing around a lot, staring at nothing with a look on your face that, you know, looks like somebody has just stunned you on the back of the head with a, with a five iron. But for me, it means something exciting has just trickled into my consciousness and I'm playing with it. And uh, I spend huge hours, uh, huge lengths of time playing with my brain, basically. Um, you know, it's like, Tad, you better stop. You'll go blind. Can I play with my brain just a little longer? Ah, noch fünf Minuten, mommy. Um, so... That's the, that's the story from here, basically. I'm thinking a lot about this at the moment because I'm actually working on two novels and some other ideas for novels and some other short story things and some other projects. So everything, and, I'm, and Deborah's writing some stuff and I'm occasionally doing some reading for her. 
then I'm talking to another friend who's working on a novel. And so there's always this kind of stuff in the air and that uh, gives me something to think about. And um, I think everybody around me is grateful for that because then they know where I am and that I'm not getting into trouble. I'm not walking up and down the hall shouting about the fact that the dishes aren't clean or you know whatever else that somebody's promised to do and hasn't done. Because I'm not a tyrant, I'm not a tyrant. Um, but it's just that sometimes you gotta wash the dishes, kids. <laughs> That's what life teaches you. That's the, see how old I am now? That's the main lesson that I've learned since I was 15 years old. And maybe the only lesson I've learned since I was 15 years old. Sometimes you just gotta do the goddamn dishes. And that's a fact. Anyway, um, it is getting late at night here. It is, it is closing in on three o'clock. I'm gonna look through here just to see if there's any other questions I missed. Okay, I, Olaf asked about the shadow of things to explain that. Olaf also asked, do you know what you will write after The Last King, Moro Stenard? Well, I will tell you this. I have sent a proposal to my publishers and one, I, I sent two possible proposals for novels. Um, everybody who knows me knows I've been wanting to write the Arjuna novel for years. I don't, that's still, that's going to have to wait until I get fabulously rich somehow. Um, because who knows if anybody would buy it because it won't be exactly the same kind of thing that everybody expects. But in, but so that I would love to write someday because I think it's a really cool, big idea. Um, but what I've sent out actual uh, outlines for are two stories, one of which was originally going to be the short novel that goes with The Last King of Ostinard, the one I'm working on now. The one I'm working on now has become instead about um, the, the killing of the dragon by Hecatri and Inaluki. But what I was originally going to do as my short novel was going to be about the fall of Azua. So that's about the invasion of the Rimmer's men. That's about Inaluki's downfall. That's about the flight of the Sithi out of the castle and um, all that kind of stuff. All the stuff that is so crucial in the history of Ostenard and in the history that Simon begins to learn in the Dragonbone Chair and that we're still learning right up through to the end of Navigator's Children, trust me. Um, you won't know that until you see it, but that's how it works. So um, anyway, so that's what one of the two things I sent off a proposal for was for a, a, a probably a single but fairly long novel called, again, very roughly, The Fall of Azua. Um, and because uh, I've got a lot of ideas about it, it's going to be interesting and there's going to be a lot of unexpected stuff that, you know, like you get a real mortal's view of Azua for one thing. But anyway. So that was one, and then I set out a um, solicitation, no, a, an outline for a book tentatively titled, a uh, novel tentatively titled The Book of Orlando. And that would be a follow-up, a post-Otherland series, uh, at least a single volume. Now, I don't know, both of those might expand into something else. I also have some very, 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 very tentative ideas of another Ostinard series, another, you know, multi-volume story. Um, but that's very early days at this point, so I don't want to make too big a deal out of it. But for the first time ever, I'm actually, you know, not just saying, oh, I'll never write in one of my own worlds again, but I'm actually kind of enjoying it. So, um, you know, I, I, people seem to like it, and it's always nice to be making people happy. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I have other books I'd like to write, too. Some of them that I've been wanting to write for years. So, you know, you juggle. You juggle and you do the best you can. Um, let me see if anything else here. Question. I have my much-loved loved pledge PDF, Ronnie writes, but is the Scissor Hour likely to see print anytime soon? Oh, yeah. We should we should release that as a an Amazon single or something. I'll have to mention that to Deb. We're doing another Amazon single, but we don't have news on that one yet. Um, very few people have heard it or seen it. Um, it's called Lady of the Wood. It's actually another Ostinard story that I had orig originally written for an anthology that was being edited by our dear and beloved and much missed Gardner Dozois. But after Gardner died, then that anthology kind of vanished. So um, that's another one that we're gonna do as I think an Amazon single. So thank you for the reminder, Ron. We should do something with 
the uh, um, Scissor Hour also, because that is also another book set in one of my universes, or at least in part. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions. Somebody says, I will buy Juna. You, you'll get one for free. You know you will. You'll come to my house and you'll look all cute and sad and like you deserve a free book and you'll get it free. Um, you know who you are. All right, let me see <laughs> anything else. Anyway, so yes, all right. And there's a there's somebody checking in from Spain. Hola. Que paso? Sorry, that's more Mexican Spanish. Um, el Español de la España. Un poquito diferente, un poquito más difícil. Uh, pronunciación, ¿es correcto? Un poquito más difícil porque lo he, lo he aprendido el tipo mexicano. Okay. Um, so, but with that, I will continue and say buenas noches. Or no, it's actually morning there, isn't it? So buenos días. Uh, buongiorno. Good morning. Um, whatever else I forgot, many other languages. Uh, bon matin. And I want to thank you all for joining me tonight. It's been great fun. I will continue to do these now. Um, I just was working out a schedule. So I'll probably do Monday mornings for non US time zones and continue to do Sunday nights. So the coming evening, I'll be doing a different reading, not the same book, not the same story, um, but I'll be doing something again. Um, at seven o'clock Sunday, my time. So about 18 hours from now or whatever it is. Okay, so with that, I do wanna remind you all, please, there are lots of people out there who are at risk to the coronavirus, to the COVID-19 virus. Those of us who have, um, people who have uh, predisposition to pulmonary illnesses and stuff in their family, we are very grateful for those of you who are doing your best to shelter in place, to not be a carrier, because you can be a carrier without knowing it. So please keep doing that. More important, well, not more important, but equally importantly, please continue to take care of yourselves. You're all super important to me, because if I don't have readers and friends, I don't have much of a life. But you're also all important to a lot of other people in your lives. So take good care of yourselves and your loved ones. And for those of you who can join me, uh, seven o'clock tonight here, um, California time, please do. And if not, I will see you all next week. Again, I'll do probably about the same time on Saturday night, my time, early Sunday morning, my time, late Sunday morning, your time. Okay. Okay. So again, thank you so much. Lovely to see you and we'll talk to you soon. It's not letting me turn it off. Oh, well, I guess you'll just have to have me on all the time. Good night.